Hello and welcome to the Catabolic Window. I am your host, John, also known as JCC Training. We have today Luke, lactic acid. Luke, lactic addict, may I say. I was going to correct you on that one, but I thought I'd let it slide today. And we are also joined with Jack Archer Coaching. No way, are we? Hello, no shout out his Instagram. Oh, wait, really good. <laughs> it's just my name. <laughs> Such a dead Instagram name, man. Fuck. I love the lactic addict. I should have done that. Oh, yeah. It's infamous at this point, bro. It's infamous. Infamous. Yeah. That was a gap. How's everybody's yeah. weeks going then? Oh, John, you go first, mate. What's up? Sorry, repeat that. I said, how's your week gone? John doesn't have This week has gone all right, you know. He only has strength. Uh, just... I uh, what? You don't have weeks, mate. You only have strengths. Days, strengths, yeah. months, years. Yeah. yeah. I just measure every week as a microcycle. Yeah, so how's this microcycle? Anyway, <laughs> go home and ask my mum how a microcycle. <laughs> well, this, this microcycle has been fairly eventful. I am, as of now, currently participating in an active study. So, good goal. Yes. Uh, what study? Second can you week of training. Sorry? Can you give us details? What study? Uh, MRIs of feet. Yes. But I foot hypertrophy is what's got happening. Have you got anyone with flat feet, feet in that study? Uh, I think there's a few people with flat feet. Do you want an extra one? Which is interesting. You can't really see it too well on MRI. Oh. <laughs> We'd love Fair it. Enough. Fair enough. What about training? Training's been good. I'm currently on week two of this mesocycle. Um, sessions are getting slightly longer. Doms are definitely kicking in a lot more. And hunger is at an all-time high. Unlike you, Luke. How's that hunger yep. been, big boy? Uh, so I thought it was all good after we uh, implemented the meal plan. And then literally the day that I checked in with my coach, I got to like meal four and I wasn't even that full. I literally just threw up out of nowhere. I was like, the fuck? Like, we'll see you, in involuntary throwing up is not the one. Um, so we made the collective decision on Sunday to drop down into a cheeky little mini cup from monday i am so this is four days in and i am 1.7 kilo down hey big big yeah so that was a it was a big aggressive drop at the start um literally slashed calories by a third from 3900 to 2600 and it feels so fucking nice to just not be force feeding myself so so good so so good anyway jack what about you what, what have you been up to uh, i've been in? battling the chronicles of jack's little tummy <clears throat> um something that I, i'm talking a little bit more about i've got so many fucking digestive issues you'd think my name was jordan peters um on today's episode of food that i can't eat mushrooms mushrooms have the magic kind what I've heard the, the magic kind of did actually. No, uh, actually, I don't know. I've never tried. Maybe they'll actually. To be fair, I, I think you'll know. tolerate those ones okay. But we should probably <laughs> test it just to be sure. Sorry, guys, I can't do shrooms because they don't digest well for me. <laughs> 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 I've gained last last week same calories um, as I was on. I gained one pound this week. Exact same food. I've gained two pounds. It's accelerated, and that's because of fucking mushrooms, mate. Because I'm so inflamed and beaten up. Um, so yeah, we can add that to the list of foods that I can't eat alongside uh, potato, oats, pasta, garlic, onion, and anything fucking dairy. And the vegan protein powder as well, by the way. Can't eat that either. I'm loving it. Rice. <laughs> so, I love rice. So how does it feel when you eat something and, and you can't digest it very well then? Uh, for me, for little J-Man, um, 
you just start, you just, uh, the room just starts to smell and everyone's like, who farted? And then you're a bit embarrassed. Um, and that's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. Like my girlfriend will come home and I'll have done a bunch of work and she'll be like, why does it smell like someone's farted and tried to cover it up with Lynx Africa? And I've got like a bottle of Lynx Africa in my hand and I kind of throw it under the desk and go, oh, no reason. Yeah. Does it, um, is there any psychological torment that comes along with that, not being able to eat certain <laughs> foods? Mate, yes. It's my mate's birthday and he got a wham double chocolate cake and it sat in the kitchen and every single time I go to make foods so like four or five times a day I see that kitchen stare I see that um cake staring me in the face and the thing is right normally you know oh you can have a slice have it as an off-plan meal have it part of an off-plan meal or calorie cycle it or swap it out if I take like however many calories a slice is away from rice I'm going to gain like fucking two, three, four pounds just due to inflammation. I'll just wake up the next day and be a bloated mess and feel watery and horrible. And like, I can feel when food's not digested well, I'm like, I'm hungry and I'm, I'm like not with it. I'm a bit more lethargic as well. Like if you give me a hundred grams of rice, which is like 350 calories versus 350 calories of fucking milk, the rice is going to make me feel a lot snappier than the milk. You know what I mean? Fair play. So yeah, Fair play. Fucking. I, think, I don't really have too many digestive issues. Where like even when food's high, it's literally just that my Hobbit digestive tract is not designed to take in four thousand calories, <laughs> <laughs> and it just says no repeatedly. I just get on the rice krispies and cocoa pops. To be honest, at that point, and bagels. Oh, bagels, smash yeah. them down. As a person that doesn't have any digestive worries at all, I can't imagine not being able to eat certain foods. How does um? It, how does that sit? It's frustrating um, because, so today I went to go get some ice cream. So I went to get some Halo. Uh, I had to get plant-based. So I had to spend fucking like six quid. Um, and I was going to get a pizza, but again, like a vegan pizza, four pounds. Um and yeah, like it's frustrating because even if I went to go get some chips, I've got to watch the portion portion of chips that I get. Because if I eat too many, it just throws the scale off. And that's fine because obviously it's water, it's inflammation, it's not body fat. But that means that when it comes around to checking in and from my coach's perspective, big man Liam, shout out next week, um, he's going to be like, well, Jack's gained fucking three pounds this week, so I'm not going to up his food. Here I am reversing out of a diet, hungry as fuck, being like, I, I know that if I ate, my food for this week my body weight would barely have budged so it's really frustrating because it's like it's another week of my food not going up because i've eaten something that doesn't sit right and like um yeah when you can't digest something it's like you can't off plan meal it there's nothing you can really do you just kind of have to like, i just can't eat dairy and so your, your method of fixing this problem is just solely sticking to rice uh well i most of my carbs are rice based um i'm okay with bagels at the minute um, but like, yeah, I literally eat uh, rice, gluten-free pasta, cocoa pops, rice krispies, cream of rice, rice cakes, bagels. <laughs> That's pretty much my carb selection. Yeah. When you do run into like these, like these digestive problems, do you implement anything to try to kind of like cheat your way around it, or do you just let uh, it happen and then you make up for it the next day? I tried Digest Max before. Um, but because my veg is quite high, that was giving me some issues this week as well. So I had to pull that out. Um, also I had to drop my veg down. So it's 200 grams per meal now, max. Um, so now I'm eating less veg and my hunger's coming back. So it's kind of like fucking double-edged sword. Cause once you when your digestion gets fucked, your appetite goes a little bit, but there's not really any ways that I can like cheat it. Probably the closest thing I could do would be do like a, a pro veg day or like a pro fat day because that's always just going to digest a little bit nicer. Or if I just, like, uh, if I ate, like, a slice of chocolate cake and just pulled, like, fucking 1,500 calories from the next day and then slowly reintroduced them throughout the week, I could probably get away with it. But still, it's just not worth the hassle. The only time that... Yeah, I'm I was going to say, that sounds like so much fuckery, I would literally just stick to the meal plan. Yeah, but yeah, literally, like, half, half the time, it's like, it's like, I could eat a slice of chocolate cake... Or I could stick to my meal plan, feel nicer, 
and like probably get more food but i do constantly crave cheese and chocolate i was going to get some vegan cheese in actually to like chuck in my bagels and shit because there's going to be some good stuff like vital life i think it's called it's going to be good i don't know boys it's tough you know it's tough boys it's so hard it's so hard i always find it really interesting because i've got a couple of friends who are like lactose intolerant or whatever the fuck it's called where you can't eat dairy i don't know yeah. um and they're like yeah but i really like cheese i'm like yeah but it fucks you up why do you eat it this is a pet peeve sort of, sort of interesting a... psychological thing of you can't have this so mm. you really want it that, that's a pet peeve of mine is uh, i i know some people who are lactose intolerant and still eat cheese and chocolate and then be like wow my tummy hurts and i feel so lethargic and i'm like yes that is because you ate cheese and chocolate. And especially when like people aren't um, like tracking the macros or anything, it especially bugs me. This is definitely just a personal thing where I'm like, right now you can eat anything on the planet, just has to be dairy free. And you are incapable of doing that. And it does drive me balmy. It does, it like does like from a personal perspective, because obviously I'm on a meal plan, I'm on a macro plan and my stomach is so picky. So I have to constantly watch everything that I'm eating. So it's a little bit of like jealousy of like um, people who get to eat dairy. Like my girlfriend ate a slice of chocolate cake, then another bowl of pasta. And I was like, oh, could never be me. I wish. God, I wish. She's going to have crazy pumps in the gym tomorrow. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to have, she's going to have a, a good time. Um, right. What were we going to talk about? Today? Yeah. Enough about my fucking little tummy troubles. We've got some questions in, yeah? You have got a shit stomach, yeah. Who's going first with the, the, the question, Rooney's? Is that the right word? I don't know. Jack, Are you going to speak or...? All right. Uh, I've, I've fucking, I'll keep it short because I've been absolutely waffling and this is probably the deadest episode of the podcast mm-hmm. we've done. Um, right, so... First question, how to mix cardio with weight training? That's all it says. So interpret that as you may. John, me or you? Uh, you go first, mate. Okay. So what you've got to understand with mixing two things together is that your the the expression that always comes to mind is you're chasing two rabbits. So you're never going to be as good at catching one of them as if you just aim for one thing. So if your goal is to mix cardio and weight training, you need to find the, the balance between those two, which you can stick to on a decent basis. Um, go to the CrossFit master, Mr. Perrin Tustin, um, as he's been doing that a lot recently. But yeah, essentially a couple of cardio sessions a week, a couple of resistance training sessions a week, and you're going to get somewhere between fuck all results in one and great results in, in another, depending on how much of that you, you commit to. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if if your goal as well is to like improve your, if you're like this quote unquote hybrid athlete, you could always undulate where and when you do your cardio. So like one session a week, you could do your cardio before your weights, or you could do your weights before your cardio. So you can like you can create moments for yourself to progress in that activity, and then allow the energy for a next session to be dedicated to the other side, which would be like weights, whatever your vice is. So, John, expanding on that, if you had someone coming to you um, from like a physique development point and you were going to give cardio, you were going to add cardio into their plan, when would you put in that cardio and how would you implement it? Uh, so, in a gaining phase, I'd probably put the cardio towards the end of the session. Uh, probably just keep it standardized uh, maybe have a calorie goal or just an rpm goal maybe a heart rate goal if we want to get that specific for that cardio session um i mean like evan centipani you don't want to let your cardio fail you yeah. before your muscles give out uh i think if they have potential to have a cardio session in the morning or if they have like a fold out bike at home even better start some cardio uh start the day off sorry with some cardio get some extra room for the calories use it as a appetite increaser yeah uh then as you transition more and more into the gaining phase i think it would 
just come down to that AM cardio and then post session cardio, maybe depending on how much cardio they have to do. Yeah, ideally splitting them up would be good. But if your main goal is getting fucking wham, which ours obviously isn't because we're actually trying to lose muscle, um, then <laughs> then yeah, at least at least do it post session. But just something you sort of said there sparked a, a thought in my head of yeah you don't want to let your cardio fail you when you're doing like higher rep stuff but in my opinion the best way to get better at doing higher rep shit is to do higher rep shit that gases you out yeah that's true yeah yes yes right Fucking i'll go in for, for one of my questions then yeah, so on, opinion on power building oh oh <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. I think Jack feels very strongly about this topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a few issues with power building. Uh, again, like oh, Luke, said, Luke said, you're chasing two rabbits at once. And I think people have this misconception of hypertrophy that you're not gaining strength or you're not going to be pursuing numbers. You are you actually lift it. less weight over time. Yeah, exactly. The biggest bodybuilders actually lift in the grams, bro, because they've just done so much hypertrophy. But just because you're not one rep maxing, just because the number on the bar isn't as high as it could be, doesn't mean that you're not chasing performance gains, regardless of what methodology or what way you follow hypertrophy, low volume, high intensity, progressing volume, progressing intensity, you're chasing performance. Your performance has to increase. As you get bigger, you get stronger. To adequately challenge the muscle, you have to increase load on the bar. So... The whole idea of, oh, I'm doing power building because I want to get stronger while also gaining muscle. I'm like, well, that's just called gaining muscle. And if your goal is more specific, actual like power building of, I want to improve my squat bench and deadlift. Again, you can just do hypertrophy with those three movements and just, you know, improve them over time and kind of be aware of potentially there's some drawbacks if they don't fit your, your, your goals and who you are. Um, but if you're genuinely, truly trying to get powerlifter competition, one rep maxes as high as possible, and you're, that's going to require you to not train to failure, you're going to have to use an RPE system, you're going to have to manage a recovery very, very closely. And then at the same time, you're trying to grow the rest of your body and challenge the muscle and yeah, grow a shit ton of muscle. You're chasing two rabbits and they're running in opposite directions and you just need to pick one. My advice would be, do hypertrophy or do powerlifting, follow it for a few blocks and then switch up, which is what powerlifters do anyway. That's just called powerlifter training. Mic drop. <laughs> there's no there's no reason that you can't do a couple of mesocycles of hypertrophy focused training and then a couple of mesocycles of more strength focused training. And actually that's going to increase your sort of ability to, to stick to things long term because you're not going to be getting fucking burnt out of doing the same thing over and over again and there's only so much you can go through doing fucking really high volume hypertrophy training yeah. before like it just starts to get a bit yeah. i think russell all he's quite a good example of that to be honest you can see in his video if you've ever watched him or if anyone does watch him you can see when he's he goes through them blocks because there is a lot more of that quote-unquote bodybuilding style work into his sessions mm. and then as he gets closer to competition that stuff kind of gets good dropped and then like you say he goes into more of a strength block and then maybe a power block or whatever he does yeah i, I just say to like most people starting out in the gym they love a squat bench and dead i'm not sure why i was there myself um you can build muscle while doing squat bench dead even if they're not fantastic for growing you you can still but do I'm them free weights I'm better sure. i hope free weights are better Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm glad okay. that JP has said, like, free weights aren't better. That's going to upset a lot of people. But I'm glad that he said yeah. it. He needed, <laughs> he needed to fucking say it. I love JP, but people in his camp are just so like, oh, yeah, mate, barbell bent over rows, yeah? It's a, it's a real shame that most of the people that follow him seem to ignore or just don't understand the key things which he put out puts out in the sense that Shit is different for everybody. So, like, fucking try it and see. Mm. Like, I tried squats, and the only time my legs actually fucking grew is when I stopped doing them. Yeah. I went from the barbell jack squat to jack on the hack, and my legs improved a lot. 
So I can confirm. Fair right. play, fair play. Let's right, get another question. <laughs> right. Limit fat gain in a bulk. Gentlemen, you don't have... eat like a bell end. Job done. What if I want to? Oh. <laughs> yeah, you just have to like sort of it comes it comes back to what you're doing at the moment in the sense of you're slowly gaining because if you eat ate as much food as you wanted to you'd gain way too much body fat that would cut short the length of your gaining phase where you need to be a, a bit more slow and controlled about things and for some people that means controlling yourself a little bit in regards to how hungry you are whereas for other people they have no issues with that whatsoever but they then get to the point that i'm at where pretty quick their appetite is like yeah mate i'm done i'm done sorry so my sort of general rule of thumb is going to be somewhere between say 0.25 to 0.5 percent of your body weight a week if you're trying to gain like one percent a week i think that's you, you're going to gain a lot of body fat and you're just going to cut short the length of your gaining phase okay interesting john i think i think as well if you're coaching someone and they're kind of going through this phase uh i think again like with bodybuilding there's a lot of like psychological approaches or however you want to term them. But I think having the correct preparation in place for you to understand what you're about to go through. If like, let's say if you're coming out of a diet phase and you're kind of going through that refeed, I think Cuba mentioned it is you return to a level where health markers start to improve biomarkers like sleep, for example. And I think you have to understand what is happening and prepare yourself or your client for that. And it will suck. Needs must. If you if you've come out of an aggressive dieting phase or you mini cut whatever, appetite's going to be high. Uh, to an extent, and who you are, trusting your appetite to give you good portion sizing is maybe a mistake. Uh, I know that I'm certainly at a point right now where if I ate until I was full, I would be stupidly heavy. Um, and also another thing is like Luke, when you talk about those rates of gains, I think it also um, is something like. It depends on the client. If you've grown up on the leaner side, you've never really had much body fat on you. You're going to be a bit more sensitive to gaining it, but you might also run across people who are the inverse and are more comfortable. So if, I've, if you've got someone, I'm sure you'll agree, who's been much, much leaner, you're probably going to want to uh, be more towards the shallower end so that they're comfortable with their rate of gain, their appetite is doing okay, and they don't feel yeah, unhappy with how they're looking week on week. Yeah, it's not like we're chasing scale weight. Like, if yeah. you, you gain a little bit less than the target is, like, cool, whatever. As long as training and performance is going in the right direction, that's going to be the, the main progression. If you're coming into the gym and you're benching the same weight every fucking week, like, you're not going to be building a bigger chest unless yeah. you're doing it for more reps. No, so it's if free weight, so you will, because it's free weight. <laughs> for fuck's sake. <laughs> And, um, um, but yeah, yeah if, you, if your training's not progressing, then all the fucking weight you're gaining is body fat. So make sure your training's in a good spot. Make sure you're actually what's the word I'm looking for here? Progressive. Yeah, make make sure your training's progressing, and you're gonna fucking grow tissue. I when I put on the most body fat, it was when I was training like a bell end because I wasn't building any muscle. I was just fucking gaining like a kilo a week i'm like what the fuck are you doing bro? <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah like but, yeah. um like uh, john said as well especially if you're coming out of um if you got stupid stupid st silly shredded or if you're uncomfortably lean or you're someone who just prefers your, your body prefers to be in a slightly higher body fat percentage um yeah accepting that you know to an extent you're gonna have to gain some body weight back you're gonna have to gain some body fat back to be performing well um, I know that me personally, um, so this week, um, I've gained a little bit more than we would have liked to, but my performance has been so good and I've been feeling so much better in and of myself. Um, but to be honest, I'm pretty happy with it. And at the end of the day, if I can look in the mirror and say, I'm happy with this physique performance is increasing and uh, I feel good, then, you know, that's what matters really. And like, yeah, I'm fatter than I used to be, but I'm in a better place. So it's worth it. This is going to be the best segue you've ever heard into the next question, just to, just to pre-warn everybody. So what do you do once you get to uh, a little bit too much body fat and you're not happy with where you're at? What do we do, boys? 
What Keto. Pardon? Keto. <laughs> oh, fuck off. <laughs> um, so that is Put when it's time your coffees. For, that is when you it's are. time for a cheeky little mini cut. Or you can do a longer diet phase, depending on how fat you are. Um, so one of the questions I got was, how often do you do a mini cut? And do you think they might be detrimental to long-term progress? Oh, yeah. Go on, John. I want to. I want to hear some words of wisdom. I haven't heard John speak that much about mini cuts, so I'm. I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Uh, I think with mini cuts, let's take you look for example with um, you get into that point in your gaining phase where food's just getting a bit too much. Mm. I think definitely dropping calories, maybe for a shorter period of time, just like increase those hunger signaling. Um, but as well, it depends how the gaining phase has gone. Uh, if you're starting to get to a point where fat gain is just kind of being the main thing that's going on, uh, your health markers are going to start to take a hit, especially if you're um, enhanced. And I think once those biomarkers start kicking in, that's when you should start start sort of thinking about a mini cut. Uh, depending on the, the person, I think, decides how long their mini cut should be. If there's someone who can go off really low calories, it could be shorter. If it's someone who needs to taper down just, a, just that tad bit slower, Maybe have a longer mini cut. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point as well, depending on how resilient the person is. And um, yeah, like health and biomarkers as well. Like if your sleep suffers, you feel like shit. Obviously, if you're too fat, you probably want to cut some fat. Um, but yeah, if you like sleep as well and appetite, they're pretty big ones. Um, and or performance in the gym suffers. Because that, that's what can happen. You feel massively lethargic, sleep like shit, and uh, struggle to push your performance, get too fat. Absolutely. So when could a mini cut be detrimental to your progress long term? Oh, that's a good question. If you're doing them too often, because uh, odds are in a mini cut, the, the odds of you progressing um, and reaching like, oh, all-time peak strength is, is very low. The odds of you building... A, a, a substantial amount of tissue or any depending on how advanced you are depending on how aggressive it is is pretty slim um so you want to spend more time much more time in a gaining phase than you are in a mini cut um i don't think they're detrimental to progress the only time it would be detrimental is if you are just running them back to back to back to back um yeah i'm not i mean i can't think of a number of like a good ratio of uh, so, to give the listeners some context then so i finished prep la the end of last september which was now 13 months ago and i've spent 11 of those in a gaining phase that's fucking good <laughs> that's good um so yeah then then i did so i did a mini cut which was about eight weeks long 16 ish weeks of gaining and i'm now into another mini cut because i can't eat any more food and that's, that's pretty good up, which is yeah obviously not ideal so yeah if you're running mini cuts like every other month mm. you're building zero fucking muscle tissue yeah because you're just not spending long enough doing it like yes it's cool to stay lean but it's also cool to make fucking progress yeah it, it's more something where you just want to be gaining as long as possible while keeping everything in a good place and mini cutting as short as possible well, again, keeping everything in a good place, feeling good, not being a zombie, um, performance not falling fully through the fucking floor. Um, but if you that's can a just... huge thing that I learned last time. Like, I was just, mm. I was like, yeah, I could probably still progress. I'll try and progress at the same rate. And I got fucking buried, mate. I got buried in like week three. I was like, what is going on here? Yeah. I've, um, I've been there. So this time around, I've. I added load from the last microcycle going into this one because like the lower food is not going to have hit me that quickly. And then I'm just going to progress up in, in reps. And if it's there, take it. If it's still a struggle, just, just stay where it is because I'm going to be in a gaining phase again soon. And I'll, I'll be um, working towards those, those goals of getting stronger because you can get stronger when you train for hypertrophy. That is, that is a thing. Yep. Right. I've got another question. Now, this question is very out there, but it's an entertaining one, so I thought I'd chuck it in on the pod. Oh, fucking hell, here we go. Yeah, so 
this question is going to be a little bit out of all of our depths, although Luke does have some slight experience. Oh, uh, I know what this question is. Yes, yes. I know what this question is. Uh, so I've been scouring the interwebs, preparing <laughs> my thoughts for this one. Um, no, in all seriousness, I can't remember what the question is. I just know it was something about that. Uh, yeah, how to prep and the different ways to get stage ready. Well, I mean, there's sort of only one way to get stage ready and that's a calorie deficit but yeah. um in terms of right we are not going to be able to set this up yeah but as especially with that with very little context but what i can do is go over sort of the key things that i learned from mine which was do a muscle winning phase beforehand don't just fucking get into bodybuilding go bodybuilders compete don't they you've got to compete if you want to be a bodybuilder and then get on stage and get absolutely fucking dwarfed like john is just grinning and it's killing me <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so definitely do a couple a good couple of years building muscle before you even look to compete you can get lean for summer maybe but i, I wouldn't look to step on stage until you've actually spent a good couple of years training properly not just training recreationally because i've been training for three years but i haven't been doing shit properly so i made zero progress then next thing would be give yourself enough time because you are always fatter than you think you are. Like being realistic about things. I'm 77 kilos now. I probably wouldn't be ready until I was like 60. That's a lot of fucking weight to lose. And that that takes time. I had a 18 week prep in total. I needed a lot more than that. But to get properly lean, I needed a lot more time. And I also needed a lot more muscle because there just wasn't enough muscle in my lower body to, to get anywhere near enough of that. Um, and then... Can somebody else talk while I remember the other key point that I was going to mention and now I've forgotten? Uh, yeah, I just I want to say that all three of us are not prep coaches. We're not prep coaches for a reason. We don't deal with athletes. Uh, we deal with lifestyle. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that we don't have goals to become prep coaches. Um, One day it would be fucking sick, yeah. Yeah, of course. You, you have to admit uh, in the industry where your expertise lies and what things are out of your depth, it would be irresponsible for any of us to claim to know, oh yeah, I mean, we know things about prep, but it would be irresponsible for any of us to prep someone. So just I, to... Yeah, that's literally me just saying the shit that I did wrong and don't do the shit that I did. Yeah, yeah we, we are, if you're interested in prep, I would say talk to a coach, talk to a coach who's going to be honest with you, talk to a coach who has experience. Um, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah a key thing there is anyone who's telling you to compete probably not the the best bet like if your coach is trying to pressure you to compete you mm. need to do it because you want to do it yeah. it's fucking brutal <laughs> and if you don't actually want to do it you're going to be one of the many many people who never makes it to stage but saying that when when you are on the stage it's a, a feeling of sort of I guess euphoria would be the right word. And it's it's not sort of anything that I've experienced before. Like it was fucking a couple of minutes, but it was really, really fun. And um, a, how yeah, did you experience any anxiety stepping out in front of strangers just in your undies? <laughs> um, we love no, it. not really. No. Hey. Not really, no. I was I was okay to be honest. To be honest, the lights are so bright that you can't see any of the people anyway. All I could hear was my like my mom just fucking shouting i can hear her voice from miles away um but yeah you can't see anything like anyway the only the only people who you can sort of see you are the guys that are on stage with you so preppy yeah. luke, mate. preppy fucking luke i think we've done our um i think we've done our best job at that question but yeah we are definitely not the people to ask so whoever asked that um in fact we can get Liam's insight into that a little bit mm. when when we have him on. So I think that'd be a good thing to sort of bring back, re-bring back up again. Is that that's definitely not the right term? Yeah, I know um, what you mean. But yeah, I think we've we've done we've done our best there, but mm. definitely not the best people to ask on that front. So the next question that I got was, will you still be having free meals on the mini cut? Will you? So. Yeah, I, I don't really know why I sort of paused there. Like, some yeah. to answer that question because that question is addressed to me. Um, it's not allowed. You can't do it. You won't lose weight at all. Yeah. 
yeah, if you if you eat a single slice of Domino's pizza, you will never lose weight again. Imagine being um, in between pizza, first off. So realistic <laughs> realistically, the um Jack Jack's stomach said a big fat no there. Realistically, the mini cut's gonna be like four weeks. So I can go four weeks without a free meal. However, yes, Jack, that is how you count to four. For any and just a fucking hell, you two. I can go four weeks without a free meal. I'll be absolutely fine. However, it's my girlfriend's birthday and it's my mom's birthday during that time frame. So I'm not gonna fucking eat our Tupperware for their birthday. And I'm gonna enjoy those meals. I'm not gonna eat like an absolute bell end, and it's gonna be fine. If a social occasion comes up that I deem to be important enough, then yeah, I'll have a free meal. But if not, I'm not gonna fucking sit there and scran all the Domino's pizza and send Jack loads of photos of it. <laughs> Should there be a protocol in place when they, even if there is a free meal in their mini cup? What do you mean? Sorry. So, like, you you kind of highlighted a bit, like, if you only have one slice, maybe two, is there any, like, recommendations you would give to having, like, a free meal during that mini cup period? I'm probably just going to eat what I would normally have, if that makes sense. Like, my free meals, as I went through my gaining phase, got less and less because it was more an opportunity for me to not force feed myself rather than eat as much food as physically possible. So the, the general sort of things would be, like, for, for somebody who's going through a dieting phase and they don't want to absolutely fuck their entire week would be just have a main course. Like most people do not need a starter and a dessert alongside a main course, which is already a fucking shitload of calories. Um, another thing is like, since since we've all been kids, we've been like, finish your plate, finish your vegetables, and then you get put in. Um, maybe that was just my mom, I don't know. And that sort of gives us that um, mental hardwiring that you have to finish the plate. But what you've got to remember is that what you're, what is going to satisfy you is very different for every single person. Like um, a 50 kilo female is going to get full a lot faster than a 100 kilo male. But they're going to get served the same dish at a restaurant. So like the, the key thing to keep in mind is listen to when you're actually full. Don't just fucking eat for the sake of it. Like... Do you need a large pizza to get the taste of Domino's or could you just have a medium and be all right after that and not feel like absolutely knocked out on the couch because you've eaten so much food and you're in physical pain? Have I just rambled or does that make any sense? No, that does make sense. Man. I think I made your answer it twice, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think the key thing for me is um, you, you've got to remember that, you know, you're replacing a meal uh, and if you're living a similar lifestyle to us that's going to be one meal of quite a few in a day um it's not an opportunity to absolutely binge um and the other thing is you might uh, be someone like me where when it comes to a free meal you're like there's like five things here that i want just pick one the food's not going anywhere it's nice to have things to look forward to you mean uh, they won't make dominoes next week <laughs> yes yeah, gone bro that's the last one you better get four Dom- <laughs> dominoes have actually gone out of business <laughs> Like if I go um if if I go uh to a restaurant um and there's like like I went out for breakfast with a missus with a mandin um and there was like a million breakfasts that I wanted so I was like well I just pick one and then I can always come back next week and I've got something nice to look forward to um so yeah and and, and ultimately at the end of the day do it for the social occasion because taste is fleeting you'll wake up tomorrow and can you still taste the dominoes you still reaping the benefit of the dominoes no like it's in the past those are just memories now. So don't ruin it by eating too much and don't ruin it by like fucking up your progress and feeling horrible, you know, be sensible, be an adult and uh, focus on spending time with people and not having to eat out of Tupperware instead of stuffing your face silly to fix some sort of craving. But Jack, yeah, we live I... in a socially constructed society where we need dopamine, dopamine right now. <laughs> we need it right fucking there. Right, I'm ordering a pizza. Fuck it. Quick. Come in. <laughs> I, I remember when we spoke about this before, Jack, and that's sort of that's why I have free meals, off plan meals, whatever the fuck you want to call them. It's not for the food, it's more for the people and the the sort of experience you can have with them. Because I could do with not having a meal off plan for a couple of weeks. 
but it's nice to go out for a meal with my mom or go out for a, for a meal with my girlfriend or just do something like that and be a little bit more of a, a normal human being. Yeah. And yeah, that that's that's the main thing for me. So it's not about the food. Like I could not give a fucking shit about food right now. If you told me you don't have to eat your next meal, I'm like, fucking sound. Absolutely sound. Whereas if I said that to you, you'd be like, what? I'm hungry though. Yeah, I'm waiting for the podcast to wrap up so I can go make cream of rice. I'm not gonna lie, boys. It's nothing personal, but cream of rice, it beckons me. Yeah, so like for me, it's all about social occasions, spending time with people. It's not about the food. Fuck Domino's. Oh, okay, okay, hold up, hold up. Let's not say fuck Domino's, but yeah, it's about the bad memories. It's just it's yeah, nice and that, to... that actually goes back to the prep thing that we were talking about as well, is so many people make their post-show plans with food. Make them with your fucking friends. Make them with your family, the people yeah. that have supported you for the last 20 fucking weeks if you've given yourself enough time to prep. Um, you, you don't need a fucking goodie bag of chocolate bars and... I feel like it's become a bit of a stereotype for a lot of people post show just to plan food events and have all these like these amazing cookies that are being made like the thousand calorie yeah. ones. But what, what actual value are you getting out of that apart from just satisfying that sugar craving or that dopamine hit? Yeah, like go go out for dinner. Don't fucking scram six cookies. Yeah. Yeah, like if you're gonna if, if you want to indulge that that part of your brain because it's been ages since you've had anything off plan, you're probably craving going nuts. Do it with people, you know. Even if you're gonna get takeout, just that's also gonna make you eat food. like less of a bell end as well. Because if there's other people around you, you're probably not gonna want to absolutely stuff your face. Nah, you say that. <laughs> I say that, but I take pride in eating like a cunt sometimes. Well, I have in the past, not anymore. I'm a as, as Jack says to his clients, do as I say, not as I do. Oh, absolutely, man. I think, you know, <laughs> yeah. if, every that's what um, that's what really makes a coach is their fault. I think, you know, helping people, you know. Coaches are people as well. We fuck up too. Yeah, exactly. Like, if I've got a client who's like, I'm really struggling with off-plan meals and I keep taking the piss, I'll be like, you know what, no worries. Like, here's some strategies that I use because I have that same issue um whereas if you're like you know if you're on a, a different planet to your clients and you're like what do you mean i just i just eat the meal plan and that's all i eat i eat the meal plan i eat the meal plan and the meal plan is what i eat and we don't off plan because that is not on the plan it's not on the meal plan the meal plan says 152 grams of veg so you get 152 in uh, we we promise jack isn't crazy right last question i got was would you push through form failure to complete failure or stop adjust and go again i asked him for some extra clarification by what he means when he says adjust and go again and he meant like do another step oh okay yeah john uh, I, think, I think if you're struggling to progress and you're at a point where load is really starting to affect how many reps you get i think there's there's nothing wrong with maybe just lowering the rep slightly and then go again for another set i mean i know it's kind of outdated and maybe somewhat a bit abused by powerlifters but weekly training volume like it's not it's not the most reliable statistic but i think if you're if you've gone into a session and something was wrong the day before or you like digestion's been off or you've thrown up or just something's happened just to throw everything off i think there's nothing wrong with kind of taking a step back and allowing yourself to make that decision just be like okay we're not going as hard today but we're going to make up for the volume if that makes sense like well, that's that. the same reason why i increase training volume across the training block is because what was a good stimulus last week may not be as good of the stimulus this week whereas if you can't fucking recover from all of that work because some shit's throwing you off plan then it makes sense to auto regulate in in that sense for for sure that's, Sorry, that's I, the word i was after yeah, so I think the, the question sort of comes down to, like, how fucking good should your technique be? Is it okay to do a couple of cheat reps? Or does things need to look like a fucking textbook demonstration? It will massively depend on the movement, and it will massively depend on the person. Um, when it comes to, say, something with a high injury risk, like a deadlift, it, it makes much more sense to keep things in a you're, you're going to skew slightly more towards that 
form over failure. What if I say, yeah, buddy, though? Then just keep going until your spine snaps, isn't it? Um, or if you're, you know, you've got a uh, uh, history of injuries uh, and you're on a high risk movement there, again, it makes sense too. But if you're going with like a, a dumbbell curl and instead of doing like a three second eccentric, you're going to do a two um, or you want to throw it slightly. It's so hard to say with words um, because it really comes down to how does it look? How does it feel? And what are the logbook numbers saying? If you're doing it to eke out an extra rep, after you've been doing it for a while, okay, maybe as long as things weren't too messy. But if you're already like three reps up and then you start throwing it, then no. Um, what I normally say with people is keep the form as similar to your first rep as possible. Obviously, your concentric speed, the hard part of the rep is going to slow down. Um, but as long as you can still feel the target muscle working, you're not bringing anything else in to cheat it and you're still controlling it. In general, saying, Asking someone, were you in control of that last rep is a good way to gauge should you have taken it or not, really. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really, really good point. Yeah, it and is. I it's kind of kind of goes into this topic, but I put a poll up the other day and basically literally just a thought because I'd seen some people with shit execution. I was like, what's worse? Too little weight um, and perfect form or too much weight and shitty form. Mm -hmm. And most people said that it was too little. Whereas Ooh. like I'm Mr. Fucking full ROM, perfect execution, pause at the bottom, keep your the eccentrics nice and slow. But I mean shit all if you don't train hard. Yeah. I'd rather have, have someone have execution which isn't the best because we can work on that because you already fucking train like an animal. That's very true. We can, teach you, we can teach you to slow shit down. We can teach you to pause at the bottom. You're going to use a little bit less weight. But once you feel how fucking good that feels in the target muscle, you're going to be like, oh shit, this guy knows what he's talking about. Mm. Whereas if all of your shit looks like a textbook demonstration, it doesn't really matter yeah. because you're not getting a good stimulus for the muscle anyway. So if you can, tr if you can train hard and yeah, use a little bit of momentum on, on that last rep, fine, but use the, the proxy that Jack said of, were you in control of it? And if you weren't probably not a, not a good bet to go for. I think this is also where a specialization box can come in pretty useful. Like if you're, if the next block after you're set up to do a new exercise, for example, you can take the previous specialization block and use that time to almost use lighter weight and focus on the form, if that makes sense. Wait, expand on that a bit. I'm curious. So head. like I have... I have a RDL, yeah. a B stance, a single a leg, leg RDL, sorry, set up for my next oh, fucking training hell. block. That's horrific. Yeah, that's and So I'm currently going through a, like a shoulder and arm specialization and the next block I've got set up is, will be a leg specialization. And so I've, I've put this exercise in with the intention of nailing down form, but obviously it's at baseline volume. It's not really getting a whole lot. So I put the exertion rating fairly high with it. And I'm kind of focusing more and like narrowing down on where I can get the best MMC and then execute My form connection. brilliantly, if that makes sense. I don't know if that's a different approach or yeah. Okay. Yeah, I get what I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah, you need to like those first couple of weeks of a new movement are about finding your foundation with the technique. Like shit that I used to do technique wise. A technique wise six months ago that felt great doesn't feel so good now so it, it changes over time um and you sort of have to do what feels good but also it might feel fucking good for your ego to sling the 20s up but are you getting a good stimulus for your bicep yeah like a, a kind of monitoring like uh dr mike talks about like disruption after your sets does it feel pumped um does it hurt the next day you know, could you go back into the gym and do another set of curls exactly as you did them yesterday and get pretty similar numbers? Um, we want to see some sort of like disruption to the muscle, some sort of DOMS, some sort of pump, especially early on in a training block, especially if it's a new movement. That's something that we, we should be experiencing. So if, you, if you're going to go in and be like, oh yeah, I did the dumbbell curls uh, for the first time ever. Uh, and then I felt absolutely nothing on my biceps and they weren't even pumped and I probably could have done it the next day. It's like, okay, well, what does hurt? Are your front delts hurting? 
you know, uh, what have you been training? You've clearly not been training your biceps, either because of lacking intensity or because your form has been atrocious and you've been throwing it. I, cu I curl the least amount of weight that I ever have and my arms are the biggest they've ever been. Yeah, I, I used to curl the 20s when I was fat, uh, but I had skinny arms, and now I curl like max 10. I don't really go above the 10s. Like, I do 15s for hammer curls. Ooh. But hammer curls aren't in the same category as other bicep curls. Hammer curls are like fucking kind of kind of pog, bro. No, no, I mean like you're you're always gonna hammer curl more than you. Yeah, yeah, else. that's what I mean. They're kind of pog. Yeah, they they are banging. I love hammer curls. Is that that's all the questions I had? Does anybody I, else? I haven't got any more questions. Hold my hands up. John, you got any questions? So I've had a question. Oh yeah. Ooh. I've had one question and one question only. I post the question times at stupid times. <laughs> and that is whether or not I should shave the beards. Yes, absolutely. I so, want to see what your face looks like. Personally, I believe the beard holds very catabolic properties. And that's kind of what we're aiming for. Uh, we, we need that catabolism to, to kind of happen so we can reach this idealized physique that we have created in our mind and that we feel an absolute need to achieve. What do you what, what, think? An emaciated Christian Bale. Mm. Okay. Sound. Every morning looks like a scene from American Psycho. For fuck's sake. Um, I, I honestly don't know what your face would look like without the beard, but I'd be interested to find out. I really like the beard, but as an absolute... It makes you look white. As a marketing and social media genius, it would be quite funny if we had an episode where you shave the beard live on what, live on the podcast. That's what I'm saying. We like Kuba in a meeting, <laughs> get Meg to shave his face. <laughs> <laughs> no, did he do that? Yeah, or shave his head. Sorry, that's so jokes. I love Kuba. Fucking hell, that's so funny. He's that's such a so legend. Funny. He's the same height as me as well. Mad, mad, mad. Me. So that was um, what an hour of us chatting absolute shit once again. Yeah, this, one, this one's been a bit messy, boys. I can't lie. I think this is the, the longest one so far. We'll try and keep it a little bit more concise next time. Yeah. We've kind of incrementally gone up each episode. I think it was 10 minutes extra for the second one. Yeah. Now we've gone 20 minutes extra. We do 45 minute hard, hard cap. And uh, next week, we've got a special guest. We've got my coach, Liam. Uh, so he's just prepped. Um, he's got a lot of clients. He's killing the game. He's coached by Gareth from the Physique Collective. Um, so say question box. Oh, they're not. Is it not JP anymore? Oh no, 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 no. Oh. That'd be an interesting question though. To talk about his experience because he got coached by the Jordan Peters. Uh, he's also been coached by Keithy West. Um, I'm trying to think who else. He, who else he's been coached by? Um, everyone except for us three so that's why he's so small um, which is why he came first in his bodybuilding show because he was so small did he bowling yeah, anyone, got any, anyone got any final words we can wrap it up before we hit that cursed like hour mark not not that I know of no I believe we've covered everything hopefully not too poorly hopefully you lot have enjoyed it um <laughs> John sent us off with some lovely words of wisdom last time. So my words of wisdom for this week is, is don't be a twat. Use roll on deodorant, not spray links Africa everywhere to cover up your farts. That's, that's all you're getting from me this week. I hope you enjoy. Roll it in the carpet. <laughs> roll it in the carpet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would be a big twat move right thank you very much all for listening if you've suffered through to this point and we'll yeah. see you next week <laughs>